All right, so I think we'll get started and then more people will pop in as we as we begin. Um, but thank you for joining us in our first ever Gardening for the Zombie Apocalypse workshop, which we never thought we would have to develop this workshop because we didn't think that the zombie apocalypse would come, but here we are. Um, so the focus of this, hey, Jen. Uh, I'll unmute you, Jen. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> um, Good morning. So the purpose of this workshop is to really talk about um, how to garden in really small spaces, especially with a focus on urban gardening um, in downtown areas. And usually when I do this workshop, um, there's all kinds of elements of it that we include in our training for our participants on how to garden in small spaces. Um, but usually we're not talking about like the most nutrient dense food or getting like incredible carbs out of your garden. So we're gonna have a different focus today that's really around um, nutrient dense <clears throat> um, gardens where you're getting a lot of carbs and proteins um, and efficient crops out of small spaces. Is that what everybody signed up for? Yes. Okay. Sure, sounds good. Um, and we're gonna do some, a few DIY ninja garden skills throughout, but this is mainly like a survey, an overview of like a lot of topics in which there could be a whole workshops around those as well. So if there's anything that strikes your fancy mm. that we talk about, you can make a deep dive into a Google search to learn more about the things that I'm sort of presenting out into the world. And I know a few of you on here in a variety of ways. Um, and so we'll be, I'll be reaching out to see if folks have um, some of their own experiences that they want to share because we all have wisdom around this. And I actually have a nutritionist in the group uh, with Jen Perry. So we might ask you to tell us about the vitamins and minerals in certain vegetables at some moment because um, I don't know have all those details. Um, so, and I'm thinking like uh, the way I've chunked it is in the sections and then after a section, I thought we could open it up for some Q&A. So whatever, since we've never done this before, we'll, we'll work with it and see, see what works. Um, so just a little housekeeping. I have my notes over here. So if you see me doing this, that's what I'm doing. Um, if you're in a noisy place, you can, or want to be on mute, go ahead and then ask a question, you can pop back on. Um, and yeah, and I think we were gonna, if you wanna just jot down your questions or you can put them in the chat area, then we can get to them at the end of each section. Um, and that's how we'll, how we'll approach it. So if we, people could unmute themselves for a second so we could get a sense of, um, okay, Jen, you might hop on and off, okay. Um, <laughs> get a sense of people's skill level in the room here, um, who would consider themselves kind of like a gardening expert? And when I say expert, it means you've done it for like 10 years. You still have a bunch to learn, but you think of yourself as someone who's like, I've gardened for a number of years and I know a thing or two. Come on, there's gotta be more. No, none, no one. How about anyone in the intermediate range where it's like, mm -hmm, I've grown some things. I grow tomatoes and basil. So this is Molly. I. I grew massive gardens when I was younger at home in Ohio, but I'm quite new to urban gardening. Okay. So I'm not quite sure where that puts me. I mean, I had a huge garden at home that got watered by the local golf course because I sited it in the perfect spot. So every night it would get watered. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it's it's I'm I'm really new to urban gardening. And, okay. And but you getting, know you know about vegetable gardening, which is the main thing. Right. Yeah. Right. I put you in advanced. So we have a bunch of intermediates who's who's putting themselves in that category. Abby, you were there. Great. And then who's who's mm -hmm. themselves on the full beginner level? Like, what's a seedling? What's a seed? Come on, Jen. <laughs> um, hey there. Okay. So we have a full range. And so I'm gonna if I say something that doesn't make any sense, just stop me because um, I'm gonna go over some things re relatively quickly. Um, so just stop me if I'm not making any sense. So. First, I'm going to talk about how to create a garden space. So in our program, we use lumber to create raised beds. Um, and we have a bunch of reasons why we do raised beds instead of working in the ground. And this is where I'm going to quiz some of you to see if you have any ideas as to why working in a raised bed garden is better than working in the ground. Any ideas? Abby? <laughs> Um, you can control the soil better. 
Yep, so you're making sure when you are working with a raised bed, you're bringing in all new soil material so you know its source, you know that it's safe to, to grow in, and you know that it's going to be um, designed for growing vegetables because you're getting it from a proper um, source. What other, what other some good reasons for raised beds? That's sort of economics. Economics, how? No, ergonomics. Ergonomics. <laughs> yes, if they're easier to work at, you're not bending your back over all the time. What else? We did one because we have lots of rabbits. So we can, yes. we can, you mean, you could do that with a regular garden, but we did the raise with the fences around. Yep, it. it helps. It doesn't completely deter the critters, but it does help keep the critters at bay. Any other good reasons out there? Some space. Yep, so it's a great way to, you can fit them anywhere, you can really make them any size, um, so you, they can, you don't have to have a whole garden plot designed, you can fit them anywhere. The most yeah, important- I this little, yep. sorry Molly here, I just have this perfect little spot on my deck where it's roofing and it's not actually accessible deck, and I was able to fit like a three by four bed up in that crazy yep. space, and it's perfect. Yep. Uh, the most important reason why we do raised beds, especially in Gloucester and in you know older cities like ours, um, a lot of the houses have been emanating lead paint chips for for decades. They don't use lead and paint anymore, but it's now in the soil, and so soil can often be contaminated with lead or other heavy metals. Um, and we certainly don't want that in our vegetables, especially with children. So we cap the ground um, and then put in the fresh material um, that we know is safe to grow in. Um, so that's one of the main reasons. The other benefits are that they uh, warm up faster in the spring and stay warmer later in the fall to extend your growing season. Um, and along with the not having to bend over and kill yourself, they're very, they're low labor and low tool use. You're not like sh turning soil over and getting into it. So it's very, um, efficient in that way. And then the, the other main benefit is that you get to maximize um, your growing space. It's like a way to grow a lot of food in a small area. So that's why we use the raised beds. <clears throat> we use um, non-treated spruce. You can also use cedar or any hardwood. It's important, of course, that it's non-treated so that um, you're not leaching chemicals into your um, soil, which when you go to a lumber yard and you tell them that you want to build a vegetable garden, they want to give you pressure treated because they don't want it to rot, but that's not what you want. Um, and so we don't often talk about this in other earth trainings, but if you're in a DIY mode or the zombies are coming and you quickly need to um, make your garden, you can use any kind of material like stone or brick or cinder blocks, <clears throat> whatever you have around that's a non-toxic material can be used to create an area for soil to go. Um, and then the most important thing is if you're not sure of the soil is to cap it with some sort of weed block so that you're putting the new material on top and you're not gonna be um, working with the soil below. Uh, the other material you can use, which is kind of great, are straw bales to create a perimeter for a raised bed and then this sort of mulch in place. So th really think creatively about what you have around, what you can source and scavenge. <laughs> I'm thinking of the apocalypse. Um, if you are not able to go and buy something that would be your, what you would expect. Um, we have directions on how to build raised beds with lumber on our website, on our resources page, if you want to go that route. Um, the rule of thumb is to make your beds no wider than four feet. Why would that be? Ideas? Anyone? Easy to access. Yes. So you're not stepping in it. Exactly. That's one of the other benefits of a raised bed is that you're not worried about walking in the garden bed. You're not compacting the soil and, and damaging the ecosystem of the soil. Um, you're never in it. So you want to make sure you have access on all four sides of your bed and then four feet wide is great for being able to reach it on either side. Um, and then which, which goes along with that is the, um, you can also, container gardening follows the same general rules as building a bed out of lumber or brick or stone. Um, you can put containers nearly anywhere. Um, and here in Gloucester, if you're looking for 
containers. Um, there's always the fish tubs, those big black fish tubs that you can find in various places that have holes in the bottom for drainage. So anything that's like a food grade material that has drainage, that has at least 10 or 12 inches of depth for soil, is what you need to grow anything. And you can make an entire garden completely out of containers um, if you need to. And this year we have these cool felt container pots that we're piloting to see how those work. Um, Jen, you have a couple um, to see how those work for growing food in small places. So that's sort of an overview of raised bed gardens, why raised bed gardens, um, and the different materials that can be used to make them. Um, Again, the most important thing is that you're using a non-toxic material. Um, I would love to build everything out of cinder block or stone because rot, the wood eventually rots and you have to replace it, which is a hassle. Uh, so bed placement and season extension is our next topic. Uh, when you're placing your garden beds wherever you are in your property, um, you want to make sure that they're getting six to eight hours of full sun. Um, there are parts of your property that probably don't get that much sun and during the zombie apocalypse you will need to at, use every space available to you to garden. So there's certain vegetables that will grow really well in shady areas. Um, all the leafy greens and all of the root vegetables do and will do really well in shaded areas um, as well as all the brassicas which include broccoli and cauliflower and all of those kinds of veggies. So there's always a spot when you're planning your garden, if you're gonna be gardening on all around your house, to think about the directions of your house, which is so south, east, west, and north, to figure out what's the most shaded and planning your garden around that. Um, the other things to think about when you're siting your garden is um, making sure that it's not out of sight, out of mind. You don't wanna put it on some part of your property that you're not gonna go over to. Uh, you want to really think about where your water source is at your house um, to make sure that it's easy to get water to your garden. Any little barrier like that can can quickly kill your garden. I know that when I've made decisions like that, I'm like, oh, am I ever going to water that garden now that I put it all the way over there where I don't have a water source? Um, and then you want to make sure, especially since we're following this theme of survival gardening, that you're putting food uh, in places where it will not get stolen. Um, our garden is right on the street and there was the sad year where I made this beautiful enormous acorn squash that one day walked away and I at least felt happy that imagining someone was going to eat it. But now what I do on the front of my house is I plant crops that people don't won't necessarily know what they are um, like carrots, where people don't know that there's a carrot underground, they just see the greens. Or I plant crops like cherry tomatoes, where I don't care if people come and take them. So when you're thinking about your property, and if you want to do intensive gardening all around your property, thinking about the, the sun and the water proximity and how people can access your property are all important considerations, especially if you're in an urban setting. Um, just a couple facts. April 30th is usually our last date for a hard frost. And so we're past that stage now. And then October 31st is when we get our first frost. And we are in um, zone 6B for the agricultural hardiness zone. And we're very unique because we're right along the ocean. We're a little bit warmer than just a little bit inland. So that's kind of cool for us. And then you may notice on your property that um, you have what is called microclimates, where certain sides of your house have different kind of uh, ability to retain heat. So I live right across the street from Lydia and on Beacon Street, and the front of our house is directly south facing. We have a dark purple house, and then we have stone and pavement, and there's pavement everywhere on the street and up to people's houses. So it's quite a heat draw in that area. And so that's the side of the house where we always plant the veggies that we know need a lot of sun. So we have those there, we put our brassicas and our leafy greens on the north side or on the east side that's gonna get some shade. Um, and so we know that in the front of our house, we have like a little bit of a Mediterranean climate there that warms up faster. So start to really observe your property and or wherever your garden bed is placed to see um, you know, how, 
what the different factors you have at play that can help benefit your growing environment. Um, and then in terms of, again, around season extension and knowing those dates for our frosts, you can do things to extend your season um, in a variety of ways. So one of the easy ways is to create low tunnels. And we're actually gonna have some kits here to do that. And the low tunnel basically is just, you're creating a low tunnel with either wire or you can use um, PVC um, piping that you can just get at the hardware store and they make use and you attach them to your bed. And then you get um, a special fabric called Agrabon. It's an agricultural fabric that you often will see in pictures um, of, at nurseries that's simply going over your entire garden bed um, like a little blanket and water can go through it, but it helps keep the vegetables warm. And when you're looking to start things early, if you're looking to maximize your garden, um, that's a great way to um, speed it up. And then obviously in the fall, a way to keep it going longer. Um, and it's an incredible how far you can take certain veggies if they have that kind of protection. Um, you can also use clear plastic over those kinds of frames in order to create like little mini greenhouses. Um, the warning there is um, it's, it will be cold and then all of a sudden a really hot day will come and you'll have killed everything <laughs> in your little low tunnel greenhouse um, because it can heat up really fast in there. Killed a bunch of carrots yesterday, I was very sad. Um, so low tunnels are a great way to, to extend your season and also as a way to start some early seedlings. You can either do them under a tunnel or you can make a cold frame um, and you can do a DIY cold frame. I think we have it in our video on one of my blogs. My husband made one out of an old um, screen door that was in the basement and it was broken and he just put a hinge on it and covered it with plastic with duct tape. It's not super pretty. <laughs> But the idea is that it creates a little mini greenhouse over the bed and then you vent it during the day if it gets warm and then you can close it again at night. Um, so those are, there's a lot of DIY um, tutorials you can see on YouTube on how to do that. But I recommend doing that if you wanna get really into the extension aspect. Uh, so we've talked about a lot around why raised beds, how to make raised beds, where to place your garden and season extension. So that's sort of like the meta like piece. The most important piece is the soil mix that goes into your garden. So pre-apocalypse, which is still kind of now because you can still get this resource, um, you want to bring in all new material. And this is where you want to make, if you're going to make an investment, where you want to make your greatest investment. We work with Brick Ends Compost and we work with Black Earth compost. Um, those are two great local resources. Um, and they, you tell them I'm starting a new vegetable garden and they will bring you a super loam mix. So that includes the main components for a vegetable growing environment. It has the silt and the clay particles um, that you need to create a, a mix along with some organic matter. Um, so that would be what would come in to fill your bed. Um, so it's like sand, silt, clay, organic matter comes in and it's ready to go for your vegetable garden. It's important every year to top off your garden bed with a fresh layer of compost. Um, this is either compost you can make yourself or compost that you order. And we're going to talk about composting in a minute. And you need like an inch to two inches of compost. And you don't have to necessarily work it into your garden bed because remember we're doing low tool use. Um, the rain will, will bring the nutrients down, the worms will come and take it down, um, and it's available to the plants there on the surface with their, their leaves. So if you have an established garden bed, know that every season you need to reestablish those nutrients in the garden. Um, so let's say that the zombies truly are here and we can't call um, black earth compost, what do we do to create soil? And this to me is like literally the most magical thing. Um, it's called um, lasagna gardening or sheet mulching. And it's a method where you can create soil out of layering different kinds of material and you can do it on nearly any surface. So let's say you had to 
the city shuts down and all of a sudden Safathia says, go ahead and build gardens on Main Street on the pavement. We can use sheet mulching to do that. And what it is, and you can do it on pavement or you can do it on grass, on any kind of substance, you start out very simply by putting down uh, a layer of cardboard on the pavement, on the grass, and then you moisten the cardboard and then you put in on a layer of like whatever available composted material you have and you put that on and you moisten it. Then you put on a layer of dry material like crushed leaves or some bark, like any kind of organic material, you're layering that material and moistening it. And then you kind of let it cook in there. You can cover it with hay or straw. And then usually you do that in the fall and it's ready to plant in the spring. Um, and if you have enough solid soil material to add to your, the, your lasagna method gardening, you can actually create those kinds of beds. And if you have a little nexus of soil where you want to plant your plant, you can go right ahead and do that in that same season. So I, I have done that method in the past. It's, it's like you're creating soil instantly. It's like composting on site. Um, there's all kinds of guides and tutorials on how to do it, but it's very intuitive. It's really around layering material. And that's a great way to create a garden if you don't have access to the most important ingredient, which is the soil. Um, so there's all kinds of tutorials that you should watch on that. Um, they're very pleasant. It's like meditative. And another layer and another layer. So that's everything on your soil mix. The last thing I'm gonna talk about in this section is soil and plant health. And then we're gonna get into the weeds around square foot gardening and no pun intended, and your actual survival garden, what you wanna plant. Um, after your garden is planted, you'll want to do um, a lot of mulching. Mulching is when you use any kind of plant material, um, whether it be straw or seaweed, or it can even be cardboard, newspaper, um, plant material that's just debris that's not diseased. And what you want to do is you want to cover any open spaces of soil with that material so as to protect the soil structure to, to keep your beds as moist as possible, as long as possible, to cut down on watering and to cut down on weeding. Um, so the most important element there is just you want to make sure you're not putting anything in your garden that was diseased, like a like old tomato leaves that look blighty. Don't put those back on your garden. Um, don't put anything back on your garden that has a seed head on it. I've done that before. I was like, oh, this sweet Annie looks like it won't make a mess. And then I had sweet Annie seeds sprouting up everywhere. So you really want to make sure that there's no seed heads in there. Um, in terms of zombie apocalypse, if you can't just go to the store and buy a bale of, of straw um, you, or you don't have enough material on your own property that you can use like leaves or whatever, um, we have the beach and you can go to the beach and you can collect um, the seaweed and straw material that comes up. Magnolia Beach is a great beach for collecting that kind of material. Of course, you have to look out for the dog poo and the, the trash and all the other stuff that comes with it. Um, but that's a great resource that we have available to us um, that other people don't have. And it's kind of cool that we have that um, free resource available to us. And then the seaweed, of course, is a nutrient for the soil. So it's doing more than just creating a mulch. Um, the other technique for mulching around your plants is to do what's called cover cropping. And that's where you plant um, a crop that's not meant to be eaten. It's meant to protect the soil um, either while the vegetable that's growing is the thing that you wanna eat or between your seasons um, when you're trying to condition the soil for the next year. Um, so you, in the end of the season, you can either put mulch and seaweed and whatever all over your garden bed, or you can put down a cover crop. Uh, a cover crop like something like clover or vetch or peas are legume, th those kinds of legumes and the clover, which isn't a le legume, um, fixes nitrogen in the soil. So that is helping build the soil that you need for the next year. Um, and then there are other crops like rye that you can plant that help um, prevent the soil from eroding and 
helps maintain the insect habitats that are in there. So you're really creating like a loving environment for your soil um, that helps maintain its structure. Um, and it's a great way to, um, I don't know, it's a great way to use up old seed. Like I create crazy mixes of cover crops out of whatever seeds I have lying around, like old peas. I will use radish seeds because radish seeds will drill into the ground and create that kind of flow in air and water flow into the soil. So using cover cropping to maintain the nutrients in your soil um, and to keep your soil loose and healthy is a great way to um, create fertility in your garden bed without having to make any amendments or add anything. Um, different kinds of cover cropping, like some will, you'll plant them in the fall and then they'll naturally die in the winter with the cold. And then some will live and come back like clover. And then in the spring, you just, early spring, you just shovel it under um, and then it will mulch and compost in place and just add tons of nutrients to your soil. So as a DIY survival gardener, your whole function is to maintain soil health because you can't do anything, you're not gonna grow anything unless you're maintaining that and maintaining it in some organic natural way. Um, so we talked about sheet mulching and the lasagna method, which is very similar to composting. I don't know how many folks compost. We have a we have our own crazy compost bin at our house, which we thought was rat proof until yesterday. Um, so that is always an issue, is keeping, keeping the rats out. I know Jen has some issues with rats at her house too. Um, <clears throat> but basically, it, you don't have to think overthink composting. As long as you have a couple chambers that you can seal off and all you're doing is layering green to brown material. So green material is like all of your kitchen scraps, plant debris from around your garden that isn't diseased, things that are sort of still green. And then all your brown material are like the twigs, the leaves, dead brown things, old stalks of things that have died. Um, <clears throat> and you're just keeping simple layers of those things. And we're the laziest composters ever. We just put the stuff in there and then a month later, we'll turn it over or do something with it. So we'll get, you know, probably a good half a yard of compost out of our system each year, which is a great way, again, to also maintain soil health is to always have that material going. And it also creates that nice closed loop of like, you ate this food and these are the scraps from the food and it goes into the system and it creates soil. Um, the only, the rule of thumb with composting is uh, if it came from the ground, it can probably go into your compost. If it came from an animal, it probably shouldn't. Um, except for when it comes to like lobster carcasses and mussels, I always put those in the compost. So you want to make sure you're not putting any dairy or meat products in there because then you'll really get a rat problem. Um, so if you're, if you're up for composting in the zombie apocalypse, I encourage it. It's a very meditative and delightful experience. Um, so, and then a couple more things around soil and plant health, and then we'll pause. Uh, I just wanted to talk briefly about watering. Um, watering doesn't matter right now in the spring because it's so wet, but in the summer when the heat comes on, um, I always see people holding the hose like this. So there's like this spray of water going like that. And it's not actually doing its job of watering the plants well. Um, if you want to, you know, if we're in a crisis situation and you need to conserve water, you really want to think about how you're using your municipal water resource and then any water you've, you've captured um, efficiently. So when you're watering um, plants that are like a singular plant, like a pepper or a tomato, you really want to focus on watering water. at the base of the plant, not like a violent rush of water that's going to disrupt the soil and the roots, but really soaking at the base of each plant um, and not worrying about the whole rest of the soil area where there aren't plants. And you've mulched well around your plants, so you know it's going to retain that water. And then I always use the, the finger rule where you put your finger in, and if it's wet up to here, you know that it's gotten a good solid soak. Um, and you want to water either first thing in the day or the end of the day um, so that your leaves aren't getting mildewy um, or burning in the sun. And, uh, and then 
you know, we have so many gardens around our house that we've really focused on doing um, water catchment. And we have a rain barrel at each gutter at each corner of our house. Um, and rain barrels, all you really need for a rain barrel, it just needs to be food grade. Sometimes you can, you can buy them, but you can also, we live on a waterfront where there are often some available. You can see them. They're the ones that are used for fish that are big. Um, and you just want to make sure that you uh, make, make with the opening where the gutter is going in, that you have some sort of screen there so you don't create a mosquito problem. And then you're basically just attaching a spigot to the bottom and you have this instant free source of water. Um, and especially in the summer when the water prices go up or that year where the water broke. Does everyone remember that year? And we were literally boiling water from our rain barrel for water because <laughs> there was no water. So um, I really encourage people to do water catchment. It's another one of those things that you feel like a real clever person because you're like, oh, I just harvested free stuff from the sky. Um, so I want to open it up. We've talked about, you know, just sort of like the lay of the land. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I see here one from Lydia. Let me get Lydia's first. And then can you guys unmute yourselves or do I have to unmute you? Okay. So Lydia's question, how much shade, little sun, can the shade okay plants live with? So um, I would say that depending on the season, like an, an early spring, I would say um, we have some plants that probably get like maybe three to four hours of full sun and they're going to be okay. Um, when you really get lucky is in the summertime, growing lettuce can literally just live in shade in the summertime. So if you want to grow a crop, crop of lettuce or other little kind of baby greens, they um, will thrive like growing under a tree, which is kind of great in terms of maximizing space. Did you have a question, Ansley? Uh, when you were saying um, the cardboard or newspaper, how much do you put down? And that's like during the summer while you have your tomato or whatever in the ground, right? So when you're- Or is that in the off season? So there's two different ways to, uh, to deal with the, the sheet mulching. One is to get it ready in the fall in preparation for the spring. And then that when you're doing that, you don't have to have as much uh, already broken down material. You can really work with like rough chunks of leaves and bark and whatever you have around because you have that whole season for it to break down. If you want to get started right away in the spring um, and you don't you know, have time for that whole breakdown, you need to have at least some compost ready and some soil ready so that when you're putting the plant itself in, you can create a little pocket where those nutrients are there and the other soil around it is still breaking down. So in the spring, you would put down your layer of cardboard and then you'd layer like some, some compost in there, some dried leaves, you can layer all the layers and let's say you get it deep enough um, and then you can like dig a little hole out, put in a little nugget of soil and compost that you have and then put your plant in there and everything else around it continues to break down. Okay, gotcha, thanks. Yes, Karen. I have a question. Uh, so I got a raised bed from Black Earth Compost yep. um, installed and they brought um, a load of um, soil and <laughs> filled it up. And the soil is, it came very lumpy, uh, like big lumps, big clumps. So I took, it took a long time to kind of pound a lot of those out to make it plantable, but there's still a lot of small lumps throughout it. And I'm just wondering if I need to just keep pounding them out, do I need to, does it need to be, you know, really s smoother um, for the plants? I've put in some lettuce and stuff, but, um, and they seem to be doing okay, but um, I'm just wondering about the soil composition. It just feels lumpy. Yeah, so we've had conversations with Black Earth about that. Um, and what the issue is there is that it's, it's early in the season, so everything's heavier and the mix mm -hmm. is really good, but everything is clumpy. And so we're in this situation. And so one of the things that Andrew's been doing for our backyard gardeners is he's been going and adding in some leaf mulch and some other material to break it down. So basically the soil you have is exactly what you need to grow in. Its consistency is not super awesome at this time of the year. Um, and it will continue to, to break down. Um, 
and if you want to add like a, a thin layer of compost to the top so you have something lighter to work in you can do that but it takes a minute for that soil to kind of settle in and adjust but rest assured it's the right composition it's just chunky in the beginning okay mm -hmm. yes jen you have to unmute okay so I have two questions. This has all been great info so far, Lara. Um, do you take your rain barrels in in the winter just to prevent like freezing and thawing, or is that not an issue? And second question is, how close to your house can you put a raised garden bed? So for the first, we just open the valve. And so if things are freezing and thawing, it'll just go right out. And you have... Um, you, you, you create a, you put in a spigot at the bottom and you can also put one at the top for if the thing fills all the way to the top so you can have a drainage at the top. But basically we just open it all up in the winter and it just does its own thing. Um, Cause if we had to bring it in and out, it'd be one more thing that would prevent me from doing it. Um, and then you can put a bed right up against your house as long as you can, like if you're putting it right up against a house, I wouldn't have the four foot with because then you can't obviously get to the other side. So we have ones that go right up against our house. They're about two or three feet um, width. And obviously we've that's like lead paint central there. So we've capped and it's all new material, but depending on, and so in those areas, like on our east side of the house, um, where it just gets some east morning sun and then it's over, that's where we're putting our brassicas and some of our leafy things and our peas. So you can, you can put them anywhere. Thanks. Any other questions on this section? Yeah, I've got a couple questions. This is Molly. Um, one of them is I got a raised bed that came with like a fabric bag, so to speak, to hold the earth. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, does that block worms? Like will worms not crawl up through the fabric? Somehow, somehow the worms get in. I don't know okay. how, to, how they do it, It's but they get there. Um, Mainly that fabric, not knowing what kind of bed you have, it's probably for that same reason of capping for the whatever soil is below and maybe to protect the lumber a bit more on the side or just to keep it tidy. But somehow the worms get in there or you can scout out some worms and put them in right. there. Um, right. It'd be fun and be like, welcome to your new home. Put them in there. Yeah. That was another thing we learned how to do at home in Ohio. We would walk in the yard and catch night crawlers with our feet <laughs> believe it or not and then you know that was that was for fishing but anyway um the other question i have is what was the what was the material i i didn't catch the name of the material that you put over the tunnels it's called, what was Agri it called? agrabon it has another name agrabon agrabon b-o-n oh like b-o-n okay Agri got it yeah 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 and uh yeah, and you can get that from like, you know, most, I mean, you can even get that from Johnny's, which is like a regular retail site for buying farming stuff for the home gardener. Right. And oh. and the rain barrel issue, I, I, you know, I had a, I thought I drained my rain barrel one season and I had a really bad freeze. So I actually do take mine in and out. Once they're empty, they're really light. So I just take it down in the basement. Because yeah, it was it was there was like a freeze and a backup all the way up, back up the gutter. So yeah, that's no good. I did something wrong. So it was worth it. It's worth it for me to take it in and out to avoid that freezing backup. Right. Yeah, I'm like literally the laziest gardener. I'm like, what can I not <laughs> do? Please tell me. That's great. Any other questions on this section? Hi, Amanda. I have a question. Hi, Lara. Um, my compost. Uh, it doesn't totally break down like there's always avocado seeds and there's always um, eggshells in there. Can I use it like that? I mean, avocado seeds, I can crush them with my hand. But, yeah. but they... I usually, when I, when I have my finished compost, I'll like kind of screen out some big stuff, but it's okay if it's there. Um, I, it's not hurting anything for it to be there. And sometimes it can be another nice meditative activity to sit there and just like crush eggshells. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the more you can break this stuff down before it goes in, I mean, sometimes I'm just like throwing stuff in there, but I'll put in like huge fibrous 
stalks of like a Brussels sprout thing and it's going to be in there forever if I don't chop it up. But I don't care because I'm lazy and I'm going to just <laughs> pull it out and use that in my next bin, you know. So it depends on how much time you want to spend futzing with yeah. the compost. And it's okay if it's not super screened. It can have some chunks in it because basically what that does is create a, a mulch layer um, in addition to providing nutrients as a, a compost layer. So it's okay if things are a little bit chunky. Do you add anything to your compost to get it to, to go faster? Not really. I mean, it ends up getting some soil in there from whatever I pull out. Um, mm -hmm. And we don't, we don't worry about, we, we're not, our goal is not to make it go faster. But if it was the zombie apocalypse, you probably would want it to go faster. So if that's the case, then you would want to be chopping up material um, to make it smaller. Uh, you would want to throw a little bit of soil in there to get the critters going. Um, the main thing though, in terms of chopping things up is you don't want to make it so dense in there that it becomes anaerobic because that's a gnarly experience having been there before. Um, it needs like, that's what kind of the sticks and twigs do is they create air that goes through the thing to let liquid through and air and all the happiness for the critters in there. So it doesn't just become a, a gloop, a gloopy glob. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And I have so, a question. We're pretty, yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, just, we have some blueberry bushes and rhubarb, so I'm wondering if anyone's doing soil testing, so I know if they're safe. Great question. Um, before the apocalypse, you could send in a soil sample to the UMass Extension, um, and we have directions on our website for how to do that. I imagine that's going to open up soon. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's quite straightforward. You pay, the, the most basic test is for heavy metals and it's like $15 or $20 and they give you directions on how to take soil samples from various parts of your property or the property that you're concerned with. And then you send it in and then they return the, the answers to you around the lead content um, in your soil um, and whether it's in some danger zone or not. Uh, but the other thing that's interesting about, well, I don't know if it's interesting, but around lead and heavy metals is that if you don't mess with them, they kind of stay where they are. Um, so it's when you're digging around in the lead soil that kind of gets it all up and around and out and about. So by adding organic matter, um, you, it actually like holds the lead, I don't know, this is not scientific, but, but I'm, how I'm saying it, but it kind of holds the lead at bay and in its place and not kind of moving about. Um, but you check, check the link on our site or just go to the UMass Extension um, site to see, you know, when they're opening up again for doing soil testing. Great, thanks. Shall I move on to a crash course in square foot gardening? Yes? Ready? But when, one more question, Laura, on the um, composting. Yep. What about light and heat? I have a place where I can do a compost pile, but it's really under a lot of trees. Like, is that not a good spot for it? I think that's okay, because it generates its own heat um, with all the materials cooking away in there. Um, and then you, you kind of do want to have some control over the moisture content. You don't actually want the rain pouring in on it. So having a little bit of control over this, that is fine. Um, really things just want to compost, amazingly, as long as, yeah. I mean, you can tell when things don't want to compost. Like we had a compost container at veteran school that clearly was not, we weren't really trying to make a compost with it. We were just kind of putting plant debris in there as a place to store it. And you would open it up and you'd notice that nothing really broke down because it wasn't a, a mix and it, there wasn't enough um, but green material in there to to get all the critters in there to chew everything up. So really the most important part is that like layering of green to brown and not worrying too much about how scientific it is. Usually we like dump the compost bucket from under the sink on the pile and then we grab a bunch of dry stuff from a pile and chuck it on there. <laughs> so it's not, you know, like you're pulling out a measuring cup or anything. Great, thanks. Did someone else have a question? Shall I move I on? Kind of, oh, yeah, what's that kind I was of? kind of wondering about, so same thing, we got a lot of loom that was really chunky and the compost is coming today. Um, would adding any peat moss to it just help to break out and get, bring a little air and hold the moisture or not really necessary with the black earth compost and things? It sounds like it's not necessary. 
yeah the yeah the, the actual composition is correct for growing vegetables in terms of like the how it feels like what karen was doing breaking it up seems to be um and then i know that what they're doing is adding some like leaf mulch or maybe some some peat moss anything to this to the surface layer if you're concerned about seeds feeling cozy in there to germinate you can add like you don't have to worry about too much about working it in, but just as like a top layer so that seeds aren't trying to fight through clumps. You can, um, Thank you. yeah. Anything else? Um, all right, crash course in the square foot gardening method, which is what we recommend for small spaces and raised bed gardens of any kind, whether they're DIY cinder block gardens or made out of lumber. Um, we did not invent the square foot gardening method. A guy by the name of Mel Bartholomew did. Um, and it's used across the board in all kinds of square foot garden and all kinds of raised bed gardening scenarios. Um, and we have on our website, our, our garden guide on our resources page. If you go to that page, it's like in the third column. Uh, it's the first link in the third column and it's a super comprehensive guide on how to do everything that I'm about to give you a summary on. So I encourage you to use that in your planning. Um, but basically what square foot gardening is in a nutshell is that instead of thinking in terms of growing food in rows as you would on a farm, you're growing them inside of squares, inside of one foot squares. So let's say you have a four by eight bed. You're gonna take your tape measure and you're gonna go down the bed and you're gonna mark these one foot increments all the way around. And then you're gonna take some masonry, twine, string, yarn, whatever you have around, because um, the goal is to not buy a lot of stuff. And you can use little nails to poke them in, or if you have a drill and a screwdriver, or whatever you have, and then you can map out this grid um, with the string. And so if, with a four by eight bed, you're gonna have 32 squares. If you have a two by eight bed, it's 16 squares. So whatever the size is. And then we have some tips uh, in the guide as to how to grid the bed quickly. Um, I remember one year I had a, someone working for me and they would like tie one little string off to the nail and like tie it off and then start again. No, you just connect the string to one nail and then you loop it in and out like this all the way through till you get to the end and tie it off. And then you can do it in the opposite direction. So you need like two long pieces of string and you're measuring tape um, and some nails and all of a sudden you have this grid that's now going to tell you exactly what to plant um, and how much you can plant in each square. So you know how like when you look at the back of a seed packet it'll say plant two inches apart in rows three feet apart and you're like well I can't do that in my microscopic four by eight bed. So this method is really designed around thinking in terms of how much can fit in this square next to this other square as opposed to what can fit in these rows. Um, so each block will contain a different vegetable and a different amount of vegetables based on seeds and seedlings. And what's fabulous is when you harvest something from a square, it can then be replanted. And in this way, you're just like maximizing the amount of food coming out of your space. Um, if you don't have string or you're building a bed that's not with uh, lumber and you're just dealing with stone, you can use anything. You can use sticks to show so just DIY, whatever will help you understand what this grid looks like. Um, so once you have, let's say you have one garden bed, a series of garden beds, we've talked about understanding like the microclimates around your property and where the sun is happening. Um, so what we're used to working with like an individual household that's received one of our beds, and this is what we tell them. We say, um, okay, the sun is crossing the sky east to west, and it's kind of like a bowl, imagine a bowl and it's going across the sky like this. And you know, in the winter, the sun is super low down here. And as the seasons go and the summer's on, the sun is higher in the sky. So really kind of paying attention to like where the sun is in, during the growing season is important. Um, and you want to position your bed in such a way where the tallest plants are not going to shade the little plants. So pop quiz what side of the bed are you going to plant your tallest plants? Come on. In the middle. Nope. No, on the north. Side. North. Yes, north. 
north. The north side of the bed. So if if you want, you know, your bed is south facing, and that's where the strongest sun is going to be coming from, is in the south as the sun crosses the sky. And so you want to make sure that your tallest plants are in the back of the bed on the north side, or they're going to shade your smaller plants. So what are some of off the top of your head, plants that you know that grow tall? Brussels sprouts. Yeah, it gets sort of tall. What are the tall Tomatoes. tall? Tomatoes. Tomatoes. Tomatoes are the huge tall ones. Anything else? Beans, peas, uh, snap peas. Yep, so anything that's growing on a trellis. So anything that has a climbing habit that needs to climb a trellis, a trellis would need to go on the north side of your bed. So you're thinking about, um, you know, it, what kinds of plants you want to grow and where they need to be in your bed so that they're not shading your smaller plants. So what are some plants that might be in the medium category that you can think of? And luckily all the answers are in the growing guide and you don't need to remember or know. Chard, broccoli. Yep peppers, eggplants, all of those plants are medium sized. And then all of your little plants are things like leaf lettuce and carrots, um, those kinds of plants. So imagine like, here's the north side of my garden. Here's the south side. The sun is like super strong over here. I'm going to have my trellis here, maybe my tomatoes, then my eggplants, and then down here, my lettuce. So you're thinking in terms of that. Um, and that's just if you have one garden sp space. If it's a zombie apocalypse and you have multiple gardens, you might be devoting an entire garden space just to one kind of crop, and so it's less of an issue. Um, but this is if you have not a lot of growing space and you're just trying to maximize what you have. Um, so we understand the direction of the sun. We understand the height of our plants. Uh, we understand that some need to be trellised. Um, or caged. So the, the plants that need to be trellised are cucumbers, peas, um, and, and pole beans. Um, there's also bush beans that don't need to be trellised, but pole beans do. And then tomatoes that need to go in some sort of cage or some sort of stake situation where they're held up. Um, and then you need to think about, especially during the zombie apocalypse, um, what kind of varieties you want. We're so, with our program, we just give people what we think they should have <laughs> because we figured out like what's the easiest um, and what grows the, the best here. You want to work with seed companies who are used to our area. So like Johnny's Selected Seed is um, a great company to use. Fedco Seed is a great company. As we've all seen, it's been very hard for regular households to access seed at this time. So we're going to talk a little, little bit about seed saving at the end of this. Um, but those companies are great because they're, they're in Maine, they understand our climate. Um, so you wanna really be purchasing from people who understand our growing conditions here. Um, when you're selecting you, what kind of varieties you wanna grow, obviously you're gonna think about taste. Other things you're gonna think about are yield. Like if we're trying to maximize the amount of food we grow, do we wanna grow a plant that's like super precious and creates two little things? Or do we want one that's gonna have like a million things coming off of the vine? Um, other things to consider are drought tolerance, um, cold tolerance, and they have all of this outlined in the catalog. So you're, you wanna look for the most hardy. Oftentimes in seed catalogs, they'll say like, this is the easy choice, which means like, kind of like what we do for our participants. We've kind of solved this for you. This is the easy thing. You should try this. Um, other things to consider um, in addition to yield is size, like what kind of size vegetables you're looking for. Um, sometimes they will give information about its storage qualities, which is another thing to consider during disaster times. Um, and then also maturity times, how soon you can expect to pick that vegetable from the ground is another thing to consider. And within a type of vegetable like carrots or potatoes, you can have some that mature quickly and some that will take longer. And then those usually are ones that are good for storage. So this is all sort of like you'll get into it when you look at seed catalogs and start to get the lay of the land uh, in terms of what your priorities are in terms of yield. Um, and storage and all those sorts of questions when you're thinking about survival garden situations. Um, 
so for instance, right now, I just planted a crop of potatoes that are called, that are early potatoes that will be ready in the summer. And then in a couple of weeks, Johnny's going to be sending me my shipment of late potatoes, which I know I can plant in a different garden bed, and then those will be ready for me in the fall. So kind of that kind of planning where you're like food soon and then food later. Um, usually when I give a training on the square foot gardening method, I'm discouraging people from growing a bunch of things that I would encourage people to grow for actually for a survival garden. Um, some of the vegetables that will take over a small garden really quickly are things that are vining. So like winter squash, pumpkins, watermelon, all of those kinds of crops. But for a survival garden, I think those should be planted. So there's a lot of um, sort of questions you're going to be asking yourself around um, how much food versus how much space. Um, one of the things we usually discourage people from growing are things like cabbage because cabbage will take up an entire square of your garden and it's a relatively inexpensive crop um, and then you just get that one crop and it's done um, but cabbage is great storage vegetable um, it's great for making kraut or any kind of food that can be preserved so you're kind of putting a different in terms of the theme of this workshop it's like a little bit of different headspace around why you might grow that as opposed to something else. Usually I tell people, grow some fancy bell peppers instead of a cabbage, um, because if you're getting more than one fruit, you know, more than one vegetable off of a plant as opposed to that one harvest from a cabbage. Um, I'm looking over here at my notes. Um, other issues with small garden beds that I usually discourage people from growing food in is um, corn. Corn requires multiple plants because they wind pollinate. Um, so corn is not the best choice for a small garden, but it is pretty, it's a, one of the better choices for a survival garden. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so you'll have to kind of in your mind, think about like normal gardening versus survival gardening, um, because there's some conflict there when you're dealing with small spaces. Um, so just to talk a little bit about some of the things you'll see when you look in the growing guide um, in terms of how much space a vegetable will take up. Um, first of all, we obviously are planting in two ways, either from seed or from a seedling. We're often planting from a seedling when that vegetable can't mature in time in our climate. Um, so obviously the usual suspects, the tomatoes, the eggplant, the pepper, those all have to be started in a nursery setting. Um, and then they get transplanted at a Memorial Day weekend is our, the cheat sheet thing that you should always remember is that when those, that's when those seedlings go in. And then there are a whole bunch of um, vegetables that don't need to go in as seedlings at all and can be planted from seed. So my cheat sheet for knowing when to plant seeds, so you don't have to ever think about it again or read about it on the seed packet, is you can plant peas as soon as St. Patrick's Day and up until around now at the very latest. You can plant anything that you're going to eat the leaf or the root of the plant usually by mid-April is the time and any in that range is when you can plant those kinds of things. So all of your lettuces and arugula, you know, kale, all of those kinds of leafy things, um, all of your carrots, your parsnips, your beets, your radishes, and also at this time of year is when you can put in um, your potatoes and your onions. So potatoes and onions and leafy and rooty <laughs> is what I think of for, for um, mid-April to late April. And then in May, in mid-May, is when you can start planting from seed all of the crops where you know you're gonna be eating the fruit of the plant. So it's like your zucchinis and your squash and your beans um, all of those kinds of plants that you can put in from seed. And then you don't have to think too hard about when to put in your seedlings because they're not released until the nurseries release them um, at, in the end of May around Memorial Day. Um, but that's my little cheat sheet for remembering. And, you know, if the world comes to a halt and no one's producing seedlings anymore, um, you can produce your own seedlings at home. It's a, it's a, that's a whole other workshop. Um, but the most important piece there is you either have to have your own light set up um, for, for growing seedlings under the proper lighting conditions, or you can do your best with a south-facing window. Um, and then 
I can give you, you know, the planting dates for for those items um, in our climate for when you have to get those started indoors. Um, I have Abby's old greenhouse and I got to start some of mine. Um, and right now my, my peppers are just, just kind of have their first true leaves. So it, it takes a while to get the, that whole project started. Um, so we have some ideas now of the cheat sheet on when certain plants go in. Um, the cheat sheet on seeds is the bigger the seed, the farther down it goes, the littler the seed, the less it goes. Usually, you know, peas and beans are going down an inch. Um, and then everything else is like a half or a quarter inch. And sometimes you're putting things in like an eighth of an inch. Um, just imagine a teeny little lettuce seed. You're obviously not going to put it like deep in the ground. It's going to be nearer to the surface. Um, so to talk about some of the um, space restrictions for vegetables. So you have your four by eight bed, let's imagine, and it's gridded out and you have these 32 squares. Um, there are certain plants that will just take up an entire square. So peppers, eggplants, broccoli, cauliflower, there's a whole list of them that just fill that square. Um, and then, you know, if it's a pepper plant, you're continuously removing the peppers from it. If it's something like a cabbage, that crop is done the moment you pull it up. Um, and then when you're planting from seed, there's um, things like carrots and beets and radishes. You can fit 16 of those in a square. So you go to plant your square. You know that you're, if you look on in the guide, you'll see you know, that the carrots are, are little plants, when they can be planted, how deep they can be planted. You make some, you're gonna plant them kind of like a grid in the square. And you always wanna plant more seed than you want to grow in the end because not all seeds germinate for a variety of reasons. So you overseed a little bit and then you do what's called thinning, which never feels fun, where you pull out the extra seedlings that are sprouting up that are more than your 16 um, so that the ones that you do have there can get big and what you want out of your carrot. Um, if you don't thin, you don't really get the yield that you're looking for. So imagine you've got this garden bed, you've got like your tomatoes in your back, in the back, tomatoes take up a ton of room. I think it's like a two by two foot space you'll see in the guide. Um, certain plants like summer squash and zucchini will take up larger than a, than a one by one area. So when you're planning your garden and we have grids on the resources page where you can, you know, plan out where you want to put everything, um, you'll really want to think about how much space you want to devote to various vegetables and why. Um, this leads to the nerdiest thing, which is um, succession planting, which is my favorite thing, and it's super obsessive compulsive. And it's maximizing your garden bed by creating waves of plantings um, so that you just have a continuous flow of the food that you want. So there's various examples of that. So let's say you have a couple squares next to each other and today or whatever day it is, May 1st, I go and I plant one square with carrots and I label that square with the date and then I leave the square next to it empty. And then two weeks from now, I plant another crop of carrots there. And so now I've created a situation where I have a flow of carrots um, because that will, those carrots will come in a little bit later. Um, another example of that is you know, we know that we can plant all kinds of leafy greens in the spring because um, they're a cool season crop and they go in early. What I like to do is, you know, it takes so long to be able to plant the sexy summer vegetables like the tomatoes and peppers that I like to maximize that space by planting a huge crop of all kinds of different leafy greens. So different kind of lettuces or baby kale or arugula or all kinds of things. And I plant them not like, like a heading lettuce, but more like a carpet. So it kind of grows up like a chia pet. And you can plant that whole area where later you're going to be putting in your summer crops. Um, and as it grows in, you can then take your scissors and cut it. And if, as long as you don't damage the center point where the new leaves are coming out, you can get like three or four new waves of fresh greens for until the summer heat comes on. So it's a great way to maximize that space while you're waiting to put in your summer vegetables um, to get a flow of greens. Once the summer heat comes on, those greens are gonna get bitter. 
Um, but there's kind of a magical moment where you're ready to put your tomatoes in, let's say, and they're so little and cute and you, later they're gonna become monsters. But when you first put them in, they're small. And what I'll do is I'll have my whole back of my bed planted with some leafy delicious thing. And I have a few more cuts I can do from it. I will literally dig a hole, put my tomato plant in there, knowing it's gonna start doing its thing and continue to harvest the lettuce and stuff around it until it's no longer good anymore. Um, and in that way, I've done a bunch of things. I've maximized my food yield, and I've also done the important thing of mulching my, my soil, so my soil's not exposed, um, which is protecting the soil and protecting the tomato plant. So instead of putting like straw mulch down, I'm growing food there. So you're just food on top of food um, is happening there. Um, so for instance, you know, we plant a lot of things in the spring that become available to harvest in like July and August. There's a bunch of plants that are easy to re-sow when you pull something. Um, the usual suspects of plants that are easy to, to replant in a square are carrots, um, beets, bush beans. All of those are easy to put back in um, into a square once you've harvested and then you just have a new flow of food coming. So that's my super crash course on the square foot gardening method. You'll see the, the guide in there and hopefully that will um, answer any questions in, that are in more detail. But does anyone have any broad sweeping questions about what I just went over? Uh, question about fertilizer? Yep. Organic fertilizer and when to put that in? I don't actually do a lot with um, Fertilizer, and when I do, I use Neptune's Harvest, and they have great directions on how to, how to use it because I'm just being very careful around um, my soil health and, and topping off with compost. You want to make sure you don't overdo it with fertilizer in that way if you're using compost well and doing cover cropping. Um, but I will maybe fertilize once or twice during the year. Um, but I don't have a great science to it, but mainly because I'm focusing more on producing soil health in other ways. Any, any other questions on square foot gardening? People, yeah, Ansley, you're muted. Yep. Um, do you go by companion plants or do you just go by height? Like there's some resources I've seen that said like, you know, plant your tomato next to your basil or like certain vegetables next to each other? Or do you just go strictly by height for yours? I usually go by height. I find that veggies don't really have a problem getting on with one another. I, there's probably some science to that, companion planting, and I know that it can help with like um, insects, like planting marigolds outside of your, around your tomatoes. Um, and so I would more use companion planting for that kind of insect control um i found like i tried to do the basil next to my tomatoes one year and i just found that my tomatoes took over my basil and i didn't get a great basil crop so um i try to focus more on height um and and the main piece around like the habit of a, a vegetable so heaven forfend you you plant a vining crop in your four by eight bed because you will get no carrots or beets or lettuce or anything else because it will just take over so it's more about that than anything else I think is important. And I've heard that fennel doesn't get on with everybody, but I've never had that problem, so. Awesome, thanks. And anyone else on square foot gardening? Does it make sense as a way to maximize? Yes, yes. Uh, yes, do you have a, a good source of seedlings this year? Because I know things are in harder supply. Yep, so our partner is Cedar Rock. Um, and we get all our seedlings from them for our program participants. And we also sell, sell them like a, in a sale that we're gonna be having in a couple of weeks so we can promote that. Um, but if we're out, they're the people to go to to get your seedlings and they're doing curbside. And really recommend obviously working with our small local businesses as opposed to the Home Depot who knows what you're gonna get seedling. Cedar Rock, you can sign up for their webs. Um, their, they send out newsletters and they've been really great with that too. It's really helpful source of information. 
Um, I have a question on the, the square planting, but so I've got my raised bed, but I'm actually thinking of using another space for squashes, like your big things. Um, it, our whole property used to be a victory garden and um, there's an area that I think that they used to use that um, got overgrown with a tree, but now we cut back that tree a little bit. So I think it has a little bit more sun. I'm not sure, I've got to research more in terms of the bunnies and things, but I was thinking of throwing in a bunch of different kind of squashes down there. And would that be something that's going to work better in a, a larger area where I don't, do you know what I mean, with saving space? We encourage that with certain, but especially with vining crops to like give them their own, if you have the land in the space, give them their own little zones and place else. You can even just put down a mound of soil and plant right yeah. into the mound. Um, so, and I, we often encourage people to do tomatoes in containers as well, because they're so, will take over your raised bed. And they get hard yeah. to reach if you're, you know, if they're already up high in a raised bed. So I would say that, you know, things like corn, winter squash, um, tomatoes, anything that, that's big and sprawly should, if you can get it out of your main bed, you, you should. The main thing with, with winter squash is you want to plant one variety because they will cross pollinate and make something wacky. Um, okay. Good advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've done the, the pots before, so it'll be nice to have the garden, but those cedar rock seedlings are insane. Like our tomatoes were just nuts and they reseeded the next year, which I'd never seen before, which was yeah, They'll go crazy. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump into our our survival garden crop list, if everybody's ready for that. Yeah? Yeah, this is great. Uh, good. So, and we need Jen back. She's the one that's going to tell us what the actual vitamins are and things. Um, so, what can we plant for the greatest yield, for the most calories and nutrients in a small space? Um, how soon can you eat it? How well will it store? These are all things that need to be considered in your planning and information you can read on a description and a seed catalog of what you're ordering um, to help you plan. We're gonna talk about nutrients first. And when I talk about nutrients, I mean like all the vitamins and all the minerals, um, more so than a focus on protein or, or on carbs. And that is all of your dark leafy greens are like the thing to plant to make sure that you have the nutrients you need in a situation where there's a food crisis. Um, and guess who wins of all the, the dark leafy greens? Who can guess? Anybody, anybody? Kale. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Um, kale. And it's funny, I used to not be super fond of kale. And then one day I figured kale out and now I really love it. Um, that comes in so many beautiful varieties and, you know, it, it, it's dark leafy greens. It has all of the, you know, loaded with the vitamins, minerals, and fibers and antioxidants. But the thing that's, that's especially fantastic about it is that it's what we call a cut and come again crop where you're constantly able to throughout a season, harvest the outer bottom leaves and use them as the plant grows. So you're never without a source of this nutrient. Um, one kale plant takes up a square. You can plant different kinds and you can plant them nearly at any point in the year. So that's another thing in which, like right now I have a couple kale plant seedlings I've put in my garden, but I've also direct seeded some uh, seed and I'm, I plan on growing it like, like a leaf baby kale where I'm not trying to grow a full plant, but just a quick cutting and then it'll grow back a few more times. So it's like you can grow it that way. You can grow a whole plant. Um, and then you have that cut and count. We're talking about kale, Jen. Tell us all the, all the things that are in kale. Do you know off the top of your head? Uh, all of, um, so kale would have vitamin K for sure. Um, yeah, lots of other good things. <laughs> so we were talking about how dark leafy greens are like the, the thing for your, to, for your nutrients in the garden and how kale is especially fabulous because it's a cut and come again crop where you can constantly be cutting yeah. those butter leaves to have a crop. So, and then there's all of the other ones. There's, you know, the spinach, the collards, um, cabbage is in that category and cabbage is, even though we talked about how it takes up a lot of space, it's a great storage crop and it's something that can be um, preserved through fermenting. 
uh, arugula, Asian greens, beet greens, turnip greens. There's like a zillion kinds of greens. Um, and all of those um, are, are fantastic. The other one that I was surprised by was watercress, um, which I've never grown before. And that has to grow in moving water. So I don't know if that's anything that has anyone has going for them. Um, and, but again, and collards is similar to kale in that it's a cut and come again. Spinach is very much sequestered to the spring and the fall as a crop and will quickly not survive in the summer heat. Um, and similar with the other Asian grains, they don't love the summer heat. Uh, but these kinds of crops are things that you can plant in spring and then you can plant at the end of summer for a fall crop. So you can have a continuous flow. Of, of nutrients. The thing that's also incredible about kale is, you know, at me being the lazy gardener that I am, I only end up cleaning up half my garden at the end of the year. And then this spring, all of these kale plants that we had came back. I didn't even, I don't remember planting them. Like I must have, they were like with some of the, from the leaf that I planted, not even the whole plants. They all came back, huge, beautiful plants. And we had a flow of incredible, kale all throughout March and April. And now it's starting to go to seed because it's a biennial and we'll pull the plant. Um, but it's just literally the survival plant to have when the zombies come. Um, but one thing, Laura, when I, um, so I've, gro I've grown kale a number of years, but I have a, a, more than any other plant that I've ever grown, I have a problem with bugs with the kale. That's interesting. The Which little, um, they're they're sort of bigger than an aphid, but they're sort of that same kind of a bug, and they cover it. Oof. I think that has something. You, uh, I don't know. Is it any of those purpley aphid things? The like purpley? No, more the greeny ones. The... Yeah, and that and that probably um, might have to do with stress. Like the plant gets stressed, and that's often when they get attacked. Um, so then it comes back to soil health and mulching and watering. Um, mm. But we can we can offline try to solve that. I often get aphid problems with Brussels sprouts and so then get never grow them because it's just an aphid festival every year. Um, but aphids will come for your stressed brassicas and kales for sure. Mm. So the other survival veggie is obvious and that's potatoes. Um, super high carb and have all kinds of other, they have moderate protein and all kinds, you could survive off of potatoes for some time if you needed to. Um, did you guys see that show Mars with what's his face? Anyone? Yeah, where he like living on Mars and he figures out how to grow potatoes on Mars anyway. Um, oh it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, and, yeah. And so you can really, you can, you can, in, and as I gave the example before of like there's late, mid and early varieties. So you can have a wave of potatoes and then you are want to, if you're looking to store potatoes, you want to check to make sure that they're like good at that. Good, you know, good storage is, is one of their qualities. Um, if worse comes to worse and you can't access, you know, during a disaster, um, proper potato seed, you can, um, pick up some organic potatoes from you know from the grocery store and sprout them at home which just means leaving them out so their little sprouts start and you can plant them um, but they weren't grown for seed you know they would do special things to help preserve that stock for the, for it to be planted um, so you, you may not have the same level of success but you can still still grow them um, i wrote down all of the things for potatoes uh potassium magnesium iron copper manganese, is that how you say it? Vitamin C and B. Um, and then the other thing that's great about potatoes is that, you know, they, they, they're planted differently than your other vegetables. They have to, you have to dig, dig a trench, you put the potato down in there with one of their little sprouts poking up. It doesn't have to be a big sprout, you can just see the little eye. And then you cover it over with a thin layer of the soil in the trench. And then as it starts to send up leaves, you start to mound the soil around it. Um, and then, you may run out of soil. Um, you can use other things like straw to and other sorts of bulk brown material that you have to build up around the plants um, as they continue to grow up in order to maximize the number of potatoes that you grow there. And you can grow them in, one year we grew them in trash cans. One year, it's like, it's all about the depth. Um, and they, 
and so you can really grow potatoes nearly anywhere. I've seen people do it with tires where you just stack tires. If you don't mind having tires at your, in your driveway to grow potatoes. Um, but they're a, a great um, source of survival food. Uh, the other one that's in the high protein category are sweet potatoes, which are actually in a different plant family than potatoes. Um, they're a tropical vine, so you can also eat the leaves. Um, and when you plant those, you don't plant the tuber like you do with a potato. You actually plant what they call slips, which are like the, the sprouts that come off of an existing sweet potato. And that's usually how you buy them in a bundle, like if you get them from Johnny's. But you can start them at home if the world ends and you can't reach Johnny's. Um, and you basically have like an organic sweet potato and you can watch a YouTube video on how to do it, but you have half of it in water and then it starts to set out the sprouts inside your house. And then once they get tall enough, you can clip them and then that's the, the thing that gets planted in the ground. Um, and they have, usually potatoes get a bad rap compared to sweet potatoes, but basically sweet potatoes, they just, they just have different nutrients than potatoes and they affect blood sugar differently. Um, and that's what makes them, I mean, Jen, can you speak to that at all about how sweet potatoes are, how they're different? Yeah, um, they are, but you know, there's, there's workarounds for that too. Like regular potatoes, if you cook and cool them and then reheat them, you've increased the resistant starches, which means the glycemic index will go down. So like it, yeah, I think, I think some of the differences are, um, almost a little irrelevant, but sweet potatoes are super healthy, um, beta carotene, um, another great source of fiber. Um, and, it, you know, thinking about the nutrients in our plants, um, the, a, a lot of the nutrient profiles came out of studies done in the 1950s and plants don't intrinsically have nutrients, right? So they're taking it all up through the soil and our soil health has really declined since those studies were done. So a lot of the foods we're eating actually don't have the nutrient profile we think that they have. And sure. so the food that you're going to be growing at home with your own soil is, is probably going to be a lot better for you and come closer to what we think. So. Yes. And then in addition to that, we've, you know, crops have been bred now for, for be, to be able to travel farther, to look a certain way. And we're breeding for that as opposed to nutrients. So in addition to what Jen is saying, there's there's also the fact that we're basically engineering the vegetables to either look good or travel well more than we are about them having the nutrients that they need. So there's many knocks against those store-bought veggies after a while compared to what you can grow at home in terms of the nutrients. Um, the other heavy hitter are everything in the legume family. So that's your peas and your beans. Um, and of course, peas are like snap peas, the shelling peas, the snow peas. Uh, legumes can include, um, you know, all of the, the drying beans um, that you can grow. And then, you know, we don't usually encourage people to, to grow dry beans because you don't get an enormous yield in a small garden. But if you want to devote space to growing um, a dry bean, um, we actually grow those in all of our school gardens, and it's kind of great because the crop, as long as you keep it watered and the bunnies don't come, it just does its thing, and then the beans dry on the vine, and then you have all of these dry beans ready to go for, and they're great for storage, um, and then, of course, all the millions of things you can do with beans. Also, edamame is one of my favorite soybeans. Um, it's another uh, high-carb, uh, high-protein thing to have around. So those are sort of like the dark leafies are the, the nutrients, and then you got your potatoes, sweet potato, legumes. Um, other high carb ones that are good for storage are all your, your root crops, you know, the, your parsnips, your carrots, um, and beets. They store well in refrigerators. They store well if you have some sort of cool, dry place. I know that carrots are supposed to store well if you pack them in sand. I've never done that before. Um, but in terms of thinking about food storage, um, those are the ones that can keep well um, for some time, along with things like cabbage. Um, and then, you know, winter squash is another great high carb food. We've talked about how it's, it's not optimal in small spaces, but how it could go well if you left it over somewhere to go do its thing. Um, and then 
summer squash is not so high on the protein, carb, nutrient level, but summer squash and zucchini are prolific, as we all know, and give them away all year long. And so if you're looking for like, if you were in a situation where you needed a constant food source during the growing season um, to make sure people are being fed, that would be a great um, item to grow. Also, as we know, we can turn those things into materials that we use in breads and other things like that. Um, other high protein veggies are everything in the brassica category, which is like your Brussels sprouts, your cauliflower, um, which we know also grow well in shady areas. So if you're if you're looking for survival, these are the ones that we're we're looking at. Um, garlic and onions have tons of. Can you tell us a little bit, Jen, about the magic of what what garlics and on, garlic and onion have in them? Yeah, so the, I mean, the allium family is fantastic for health, and I think they have those sulfur compounds that are, are so good and help boost the immune system, um, and there's so many, like, tasty varieties, and those store, those store pretty well, too, right, if you get the right kind. Yep, so, and you can select for, for storage. Um, also, there's different um, perennial kinds, like a uh, walking onion, they're called, and they they actually set bulbs on top and then like flop over and then remake themselves there. Karen, right across the street from the the church there, where the museum is, there's a house that has walking onions all over the place, and I see them. I'm like. They just keep going and spreading everywhere. Um, so that's a great way to have like onions immediately. Things like chives that come back every year give you that onion quality um, that come back every year. Um, and not only do you want them for their health benefits, but imagine in a survival situation, which I've been studying a lot of lately, like how much of a bummer it would be to not have things taste good <laughs> when, when things are bad and you're making food out of beans or whatever, you want to make sure that you have the flavor that is provided, um, which brings me to herbs in general. Um, there's two different kinds. There's the perennial that come back year after year and um, your annuals. Annuals are like your basil, your dill, your cilantro. And then I encourage everybody to somewhere on your property have like a sage and an oregano. These are things that will just come back year after year and provide um, flavor for food um, when you're doing so much of making your own food. Um, one other thing that I found was interesting in the high protein category was asparagus. Asparagus, um, is a perennial and it's, it, so it means it's coming back year after year that would need its own garden bed devoted to it. Um, but right now that's what we're living off of on our little farm. Now we're done with our wintered over kale and now it's all about asparagus, um, at our farm reading it every night and it's lovely. Um, wanted, we're going to talk a little bit about, so a little bit more on perennial garden, perennial vegetables. We usually don't encourage people to grow perennials in small garden beds because they have a tendency to spread. So like mint, never put it in your little raised bed garden, put it in a pot somewhere because it will just take over. Um, but there are all kinds of perennial foods that are fantastic for a survival garden because you know they're going to come back year after year and you don't have to fuss with it and you know it's food that's coming. So asparagus, Jerusalem artichoke is another, it's like a, creates like a little tuber, big beautiful flowers. Um, I don't particularly like them. They're different from potatoes. They have some different, do you know, Jen, what their different quality is? They have a something that's they, good diabetic. Um, Jerusalem, Jerusalem artichokes have a lot of inulin in them, um, which can uh, be great for, I think it's, um, a prebiotic for your body, right? So it's feeding, it's feeding the bacteria. Um, and I, I, but I don't know too much more about them. I've only, I think I've only had them once. Yeah, they're not like, they're, they're, they're a unique flavor and they, but they're nice if you mix them in with other root crops, but they're definitely a thing that spreads and that they're there and is a good survival food and they make pretty flowers. And I, the, the main thing I know about them in terms of their health benefit is that they're, I know that they're better for, for people that are diabetic. There's something about the, the sugar levels in them that's different than, than potato. Um, other, so berry crops, someone mentioned their blueberry bushes. If you could have like a high bush blueberry bush somewhere, if you could um, have a little area devoted to strawberries, um, we know berries are like packed with antioxidants and they're fantastic. Um, 
a few other, we talked about the bunching onions, perennial herbs, things like horseradish you can grow, rhubarb, sorrel. There's a lot of crops that it's nice to know that they're coming in. I was very happy to know this season that like instantly I was going to have sorrel for my salad. And um, so to have that kind of like vague food security around some certain crops is important for a survival garden. And of course, if you have space, there's fruit trees and other things you can do to do like a permaculture type perennial garden. Um, wanted to talk for a hot second about grains. So obviously in a small space, you're not gonna have the room to grow wheat and oats and things like that. And that's where you're strategic around, you know, if you're planning a survival garden to source those materials separately um, and, or maybe work with a local farm like Alprilla who, who does wheat. Um, but there are the, the two seed crops that you can grow in small places are quinoa and amaranth, which are pseudo grains. They're actually the seed of the plant that you're eating. And they are just super packed with protein and um, carbs. Uh, and you're basically harvesting the seed of the plant. We're growing quinoa for the first time this year. You need, what is it? You need 10 plants to get one pound. So obviously, you know, you have to think about, again, space to food ratio and what your goal is around a survival garden in terms of how much food you want and what kind of food. Um, and with amaranth, the benefit there is also you can eat the leaves like you would spinach. So it's like a two, two crop thing. And they're also beautiful. Um, corn, we talked about how it takes up a lot of space because it's wind pollinated and you need to have enough plants. But really you only get like two ears of corn off of a stalk. So it's not, it's less, if you don't have a lot of space, it's not the best thing to grow in terms of survival. If you have more space, I would encourage growing something like popcorn or like a flint corn where you're going to be turning it into a flower that can be stored um, is in terms of longevity that's what you want to do um yeah i think that's all i have on grains and then you know quickly around um preserving food you know, the electricity is still going. We can freeze food. Um, usually you, all you have to do is parboil leafy greens, get them into a, you know, dry them out as much as you can, get them into a freezer safe plastic bag, squeeze all the air out, seal it up. If you have a chest freezer, if it's a deep freeze, that's the better place to put those kinds of foods. Um, you can dehydrate food with a food dehydrator. Um, if you want to take on canning or fermenting, I mean, there's all different roads you can go down around food preservation based on what you're up for. Um, in terms of seed saving, as we found that, you know, it can be hard to access seed. Um, if you haven't really done a lot with seed saving, I would imagine, uh, I would suggest you start with like the easiest ones, which is saving dried beans. Um, which literally they just dry and there's the bean and you're done and you put it in a, in a dry area and you'll have it for next year. And then you can, the other easy group is like tomatoes and peppers. You can save those seeds. You kind of spread them out on a paper towel, let them dry. Um, and then you have them for next year. In order for your seeds to breed true, they need to be um, a non-hybrid variety. So you, you can, you, there's certain companies like Seed Savers Exchange that will send you like heirloom um, crops that will reproduce the same the following year. Um, I mentioned before around squash, how squash is kind of weird um, to save because they will hybridize with whatever squash pumpkin thing is around them. And I actually, my husband just told me last night as I was preparing for this, like, oh, did you know you could get toxic squash by the squash cross pollinating with some other wild cucumbery thing. I was like, no, but so clearly careful with your squash seed <laughs> that you don't, um, that you know what you're doing if you're se saving those. Um, and then there's certain crops that are really challenging around seed saving, um, like carrots and kale, which are biennials, which means that they'll come back in the next year and that is the year that they produce seed. So those crops can be more challenging. So start, take baby steps with your seed saving. Um, so any questions around these survival crops? Is it all what you expected, these survival crops? Any surprises? Um, so I just wanted to touch super fast and then we can, um, 
and then we can just wrap it up all together. I wanted to talk for one minute about humans, how to work with the people who are not zombies um, in terms of how to function in these times when we need to collaborate with each other better to um, everyone get what they need. We're so used to in our culture having this like pull yourself up by your bootstraps, nuclear family, we take care of ourselves, and we, you know, and in a survival situation, it's really important to collaborate and cooperate. Um, so some of my suggestions around that would be to create like a neighborhood co-op or a friend group co-op where you work together to get the supplies and resources that you need, um, to order bulk materials of something, to make purchases, um, to do labor. Like Jen says, I need, I need my, my group to come over and help me set up my rain barrel. We go over there, we do that, like burn raising kind of stuff. And then someone else needs help kind of that kind of old fashioned thinking. And then, you know, there's all kinds of free materials that you can access, like there's Craigslist, Free Cycle. There's some Facebook group now that's the Buy Nothing group. It's amazing what, what I've got all kinds of things for free, um, especially for bed building materials. People are like, come but get this pile of brick out of my yard and you just go get it and then you have a garden bed. And then just, you know, really thinking about bartering. Um, if you create a farm situation where you're gonna focus a cert on a certain crop, maybe you have a friend who's focusing on a different crop and you're creating. So that, that's part of your sort of thinking around your garden. So I don't wanna go too over time. I wanted to leave any time left for questions about um, survival, <laughs> zombies, um, how to plant a garden. Anyone else have any closing questions? No closing questions, but thank you so much for all the information. This is Molly. This is really, um, you, I, didn't, I didn't think about dark leafy greens and the idea that you can um, keep them going by cutting the leaves underneath and just letting them keep growing. It, it's really great information. This is a tremendous resource. Thank you. Great. And I encourage everybody to, to look at the growing guide because um, it's got the pictures, it tells you exactly what to fit where with your square foot gardening and has all the planning tools. And then Laura, I do have a question, um, and you may have gone over this. I'm sorry I was late. If you did, it's fine. Just skip it. But um, how much do we have to worry about planting things in our yards that's, you know, that the food will suck up anything weird that's in the soil? Yeah, we talked about that in the very beginning, and that's where you, um, you want to cap the soil and not use that soil and put in a raised bed and bring in new material. Um, and we have a lot of information about that also in our growing guide, if you missed it in the beginning. Oh, okay. But you really, it's, oh, yeah. you want to avoid using existing soil unless you can test the soil, which is difficult to do right now because they're still closed. Yeah, okay. All right, okay. So if anyone has any follow-up questions for me afterward, I'm happy if you want to send me an email or anything. Or And also, because this is the first time I've ever done this workshop, if you have any feedback on what you wanted to know more about or what didn't seem clear, I'd love to hear what, what everyone has to say. And uh, happy gardening. And um, join our mailing list if you're not already on it so you know when our seedling sale is coming up and other things that we're doing. Thank you so much, Lara. Thank this you, Lara. Was Thank you guys. Thank you. Have a really wonderful great day. Day. All right, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.